Hey. Well, welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. For those of you that are new, um, we are a Bible teaching church. We believe that the Word of God is contained in 66 books and what we call the Bible, which is the Old Testament and the New Testament. We believe it is God breathed, Amen. that He breathed through the instruments of writing those things, and we take it seriously. Not all of it's literal, but we do take it seriously. And so that's what Grace Bible Fellowship's about. If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of fellowship going on. Amen? Amen. Trying to get you guys to sit down. It's like hurting ferrets. Yeah, that's right. But praise God, you know, there, there are bigger problems in the world than that. So I am, I am quite happy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, I'm... I'm just overwhelmed with joy because of starting this new book. I pray, Lord, that we might all sense your presence here with us. That you want to do business with us, with our hearts, with our minds. And I pray as we read your word that it would find fertile soil in our hearts. It wouldn't just be an academic exercise. It wouldn't be just going over information but Lord, that it might be our living hope in you. Help us as we look at your word, that you might apply it to our lives, make it relevant to the way that we live, that we would be made into the image of your son more fully. So Lord, I commit myself to you. I commit this time to you and each one of us. I pray that you help us, that your spirit might lead us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, as you may know, we are in the book of Hebrews. So we have finished after a year and two months uh, Genesis, and we're moving on, and I figured I'd jump into the New Testament for lots of reasons, but we're going to actually be looking back. All of the information that we studied recently in the book of Genesis is going to be somewhat digested through the lens of grace in Hebrews. So we're going to move on to the book of Hebrews. So this week, I don't know if you guys know what that symbol is. Greater than. Greater than. Very good. We got some mathematicians. And that's essentially the book of Hebrews. How Jesus is greater than. And it's, it's an important point. And so uh, whenever you see that little sideways V, you'll remember. I don't know why I put it up there. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, and the very first word of the book is God. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So we get this super doctrinal statement right at the outset. Typically, you would have Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or you would have one of those things. You would have the address, uh, the people that you're going to speak to and the person who wrote it. You'd have all of that as the introduction. There's no introduction here in the book of Hebrews. Isn't that interesting? Makes you go, very good, right on cue. <laughs> We're going to pick it up at the author. At the author, now you guys may have some different opinions. Of course, we all have different opinions. Some of them are better than others. There are people that will say that the book of Hebrews is written by Paul the Apostle. Well, most of the New Testament is. And so that wouldn't be a surprise. We see some familiar structure in there. Uh, the first 12 chapters are going to be information, and then the last chapters are going to be application. So we see that in some of the letters of Paul. We see some of the structure, Pauline structure in it, uh, some of the arguments. We see a rich heritage in uh, the faith, in the Hebrew faith. And so whoever it is who wrote the book of Hebrews knows a whole lot about the Hebrews. You would assume that they were steeped in that tradition and very knowledgeable of the Old Testament scriptures, which Paul certainly would fit the bill. There are some people that believe Apollos wrote this because it's a higher form of Greek. You know, they have English like we speak in America, 
And then there's English they speak in England. All right? And, and people in England would never think that we speak English. Uh, they, of course not. You don't speak English. Not the Queen's English. You know, so uh, unless you're speaking Shakespeare, it's unqualified. But there, this is actually a higher form of Greek that's written here in Hebrew. So it's a higher form of Greek than what we have in the rest of the New Testament. So it's remarkable. It's something to say. Hmm, a little slow on the uptake, but okay, good. It's something that makes you get curious. There are some people that believe Apollos wrote this because he was a, he was a gifted orator. Uh, there are people that say the book of Luke is very similar uh, because it's information. And so his fingerprints are all over this. But I can tell you without a doubt, I know who wrote the book of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit of God. Whether it was a pen or a pencil or crayon, it was God that was moving. Amen? Amen. Because I know that the Holy Spirit wrote it. It says here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to tell you that the author is God writing through the Holy Spirit in some instrument. And so I'll, I'll tell you because having arguments otherwise is just academic and silly and won't make a difference how you live your life. So next is the audience. They're obviously Hebrews. It's not about me making coffee for my wife. <laughs> Hebrew Christians who are struggling with their newly forged faith in Christ and their life in grace. So you have to understand that, and it's probably written to those who are in Jerusalem. Now, there are some people that say, Paul definitely wrote this book. Well, it's interesting. Paul always tells people who he is when he writes the book, right? But he doesn't hear. If Paul wrote it, why would he not put his name? Because it might not be easily received by those who are Hebrews. Because Paul, who used to be Saul of Tarsus, who used to kill Christians, became a Christian, and suddenly the Jews hated his guts because they felt that he was a, a heretic. So it may be that Paul didn't put his name on this for that reason. I'm just here to muddy the waters, just to make you completely confused. You should thank God you don't have to read through all the books I do before I stand up here. But Hebrew Christians struggling with their newly forged faith. Now, some of you may have come from another faith besides being here at Grace Bible Fellowship all your life. Uh, this hasn't been a church for all your life or all my life. So you probably come from some tradition. You can imagine coming into a church, even today, and coming from another tradition and saying, oh, I really miss what we used to do in that old church of mine. You know, at least we got some aerobics. We'd have to stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. <laughs> you know, you're always doing something with your right arm. You know, and so there are people that come from that tradition. There are people that come from, you know, uh, a, a more Protestant thing, which, you know, oh, praise God from whom all blessings. And you have the doxology, you know, and you have all these things in our father who art in heaven. You know, and, and you can just rattle this stuff off like you were a rapper. So you come from all these traditions and coming into Grace Bible Fellowship and saying, I really miss the pipe organ. I mean, I wish we had a big, monstrous pipe organ half the size of this room. That would be so awesome. And there are places where you can go, and they still have such things. Uh, we don't. So that's just the way that it is. So you can imagine, here are these Christians who come out of the Jewish faith, and they're looking forward to the Messiah, and they understand all of the tradition and the things they're steeped in, including the dietary laws, the sacrificial system, uh, going for the feasts, for the three main feasts of the year that everybody had to attend, and all of that, and suddenly, Jesus is enough. Jesus has it all covered. He's the one sacrifice for your sin. He is <laughs> Rosh Hashanah. He is He's all of it. Together, Jesus is enough. And then some of them saying, oh, I feel a little guilty because I'm not doing all the things that those people are doing. I haven't lit a candle for somebody who's been dead for a long time. You know, and I haven't paid money to the church, you know, to have somebody prayed out of purgatory. And I haven't, you know, and there are people uh, you can imagine that have had a particular experience that suddenly are missing that because they think they're missing something. Well, that is who 
they're writing to. That is the audience of this book. And so if you're not Hebrew, and if you haven't been steeped in the Hebrew traditions and in the Old Testament and in the sacrifices and in all of that, then you might feel a little left out. But good enough that we have the Old Testament. And it's a good enough thing that it's explained to us by the author and that the Holy Spirit sees fit to preserve it and get it to us. So the audience is going to be Hebrew Christians. So we have to kind of look through that lens because he's not speaking to Gentiles. He's not speaking to those who come from that. He's speaking to Jews. Make sense? sense. It's going to make everything so much easier as we read through this book. Because if you read it like a Christian, you'll be like, that ain't right. But if you read it like you're a first century Jew listening to somebody tell you about how Jesus is enough, it suddenly is a wonderful book. Especially when we get to chapter 6, chapter 10, there's some very difficult passages. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Okay. When we get there, I think you guys will be very satisfied. Look through the Jewish lens and it makes a lot of sense. And the third thing is the argument that Jesus is superior in every way that Jesus is the greatest. And you're going to see as we go through, and that's the theme that kind of weaves through the entire thing. So you can remember the greater than symbol as we go through. Not Muhammad Ali. Do you remember Muhammad Ali? How many of you remember? A few. Okay, we got some old people here. Good. I float like a butterfly. I'm so, I'm so pretty. You know, that was, that was, and his famous statement is, I'm the greatest. I'm the great. You don't believe me. Look, I'm the greatest. I said that even before I knew I was. Don't tell me I can't do something. Don't tell me it's impossible. Don't tell me I'm not the greatest. I'm the double greatest. <laughs> so that was Muhammad Ali. But I can tell you in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is seen to be the greatest, Amen. not Muhammad Ali. So you might have to unlearn some of what you've heard. Verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Well, that's rather curious. By the way, it's all about Jesus. And Muhammad Ali will not be mentioned once. We see that God has spoken. Interesting that God would speak. That God, who created everything, would have anything to do with human beings. I mean, we're just a little bit above animals because we have a spirit. And that God would speak to us at all is a miracle. I mean, do you speak to ants? I don't want to know. Do you speak to ants? (laughs) Think about that. Uh, That is a much closer proximity than God to us. And yet he speaks to us. And I just want to let you know, God speaks and he still speaks. And he's spoken in times past and he's used all sorts of things. Thunder and lightning. God spoke out of that. He's used trumpets. He's used a still small voice. Uh, He'll use a donkey if you won't listen. He uses nature. He uses conscience. He uses creation. He uses everything. And he speaks to us in visions and dreams and angelic visitations There's human form that that Jesus has shown up before his birth in a human form. There's light, there's smoke, there's parables. God has done all sorts of things to speak to us as human beings over the time. But he's spoken to the fathers. Now, if you're a Jewish person, you understand what that means. It's not the founding fathers. You might have, have that in your mind. It's actually the Jewish fathers. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's All the way down from Adam, all the way down to now, God has spoken, and he's spoken through prophets. There is a particular office where someone is touched by God to speak to people. I I would like to think that I'm in that category, since I'm the one up here speaking, for the most part. And so there are prophets. There are those that God says, listen, I I, want to say something to these people. Uh, Would you be my microphone? And he has spoken over the years through his prophets. Now, I believe that that particular office is closed and there's nobody writing any new scripture, just so that you don't misunderstand, because I'm sure that my very doctrinal brother over here will have a conversation with me. But 
just so that you understand, uh, the, the, the very end of Revelation says anybody who adds or subtracts from this book, what will be added and subtracted to you is not a good thing. It would be the plagues that are listed in the book. So there are prophets. We know some of them as scriptural books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and, and on and on. Those are some of the prophets. And then you have Nathan, you have Elijah, you have Elisha, which their names are so similar. Why? I don't know. But I, I wouldn't name my kids that because it's real hard to call them. But you have prophets who God has used to speak to people in the past, but recently in these end times, and it's interesting that the author would call the times they were living in almost 2,000 years ago, end times. Isn't that curious? Yeah. End times. Any time from the point Jesus resurrects to now has been the end times. If you're looking on a timeline, just so that I'd let you know that. It says that he has spoken to us by his son. This is a possessive singular. There is no other. That's what it's saying. This is his son. He has no other son. It's his only begotten son. And there's a process. He is the heir of all things and the agent of creation. Well, wait a minute. How could Jesus be the agent of creation before he was born in a manger? That's a very curious thing that the scripture states that Jesus pre-existed his birth, not in a physical body. Isn't that interesting? Well, the only one I know that does that is God. I just thought I'd bring that up just to stir the pot. And through whom he also made the worlds. Actually, the worlds, it's actually, these are all the definitions for the worlds. Forever, an unbroken age, perpetuity of time, eternity, the worlds, universe, period of time, and age. Basically, time. You, you, you guys know that time is a created thing? It, it doesn't exist without matter. Because if, if you had matter and you had no time, the question is when. And then if you had mass, anyway. It's a whole scientific thing and I don't want to get into it. But time is a created thing and God is going to take time and flush it at the end. And there will be more, no more time. It's not like God has lots of time. He's outside of time. I, I hear some of your brains leaking out. <laughs> Through him, he made the world. He made time. So Jesus is responsible as an agent of creation. That's, pretty, that's a pretty big thing coming right out of the gate in the first couple verses, right? Verse 3, who, speaking of Jesus, being the brightness of his glory, meaning God, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now he's bringing up the question of angels. If you know anything about the Jewish community, they reverence angels. Angels were very instrumental in the Old Testament. They have all sorts of places, and we'll probably get into some of that, whether I like it or not. But the brightness of his glory is the effulgence. Everyone say effulgence. effulgence. There's a vocabulary word for the day right there. That is the, the expression. That is the full brightness of his glory. That's who Jesus is. It's like when you see the sun come out after the rain and the rays are coming through, that radiance right there, that's what Jesus is. It's that which you see of the sun because you, you can't look at the sun. Don't, don't, please don't try. Unless you have a lens, you can block it out and there's a solar eclipse and you've got a good reason. Don't do it. But you can see that radiance. And that's what the author is trying to tell us. It's this radiance, this brilliance of who Jesus is, that he is the fullest expression of God's glory to us. So it's not like you're missing anything like, well, Jesus really wasn't all that. Oh, oh, he was. He is the fullness of who God is expressed to us in human form. He is the express image of his person. First of all, God's a person. Isn't that interesting? Yes. He's not a human, but he's a person. He has characteristics. He's got a personality. There's stuff that makes him mad. Isn't that unusual? 
God is a person, and you can speak to him that way. In fact, he, he likes to call himself our father. In fact, Jesus said, when you pray, pray in this manner, our father. So it's not unusual to think of God as that. He's a person. Jesus is the express image of his person, just like you might put an image of somebody on a coin. It's like, hey, what's on your dollar bill? George Washington. That's not George Washington. It's a picture of George Washington, right? You guys know that, right? <laughs> Unless I'm wrong. And who's on the nickel? A picture, an express image of Thomas Jefferson. That's right. You got to be careful with these things when you speak to people. People get you after church say, Pastor George Washington is not on the dollar bill. So, okay. Who is? A picture of George Washington. Okay. So, <laughs> Jesus is the fullest expression of who God is in human form. Wow. That's big. That's big. Colossians 1.19 said, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. All the fullness of who God is is seen in Christ. All of it. Amen. Well, what about, nope, all of it. That's how big Jesus is. And he's not an angel. Contrary to people who knock on your door and ride bicycles. <laughs> because the scripture tells us that. He's no angel. Because it's the fullest expression of who God is. He doesn't say that about any angels, by the way. We're going to get into that. And that he holds all things together. I find that amazing. By the word of his power. Who does? Jesus does. Jesus does? Yes, Jesus does. Is he going to argue all day? Perhaps. Yes, Jesus holds everything together by the power of his word. Well, I thought God did that. Do you see why there's a trinity? Do you see why Jesus is equal to the Father? Different job qualifications, obviously, different uh, position, but he's equal to the Father. Like, my, my wife is equal to me, except in arm wrestling. <laughs> equal spiritually before God. And so, he holds all things together in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. You can see I was reading Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn, by the way, that's a position, not an order of being created. The firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created. All things? Yes. Can't possibly mean. Yes, it does. It means all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. That would mean angels, fallen angels. That would mean everything. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. That is a strong statement of deity, is it not? Yes. About who Jesus is. And he is before all things. In other words, he was there before anything else was. And in him, all things consist or all things hold together. It's the molecular glue that holds you together is God's will. Aren't you glad that he's not mad at you anymore? I, I don't want to fall apart. He's the brightness of his glory. And when he had himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on I, becoming so much better than the angels. You see, here's, he's bringing up the angels by his power. His power was demonstrated in him dying. That's how your power is demonstrated too. When you die to yourself and you do something that the Lord would have you do as opposed to what you feel like doing. Amen. That's how God's power works through us. Jesus said in John 19, 30, it is finished. To telestai, which means the debt is paid in full. Jesus paid the full debt of what we owe God for our sin, which means by accepting him and accepting his leadership, his lordship, and his sacrifice on the cross in my life, I am free from the punishment of sin and the power of sin. And we now have an obligation to live for him forever. Amen? Amen. In chapter five of Revelation, I didn't put the thing up there, sorry. 
John is having this incredible vision. He said, come up here. And he comes up and he sees this vision. God begins to reveal things to him. And he says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. You read through Revelation, there's a lot of weird stuff. There's dragons and seven heads and horns and, you know, it's trumpets and bulls and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in Revelation. But here John sees this scroll and the call goes out by a mighty angel. If he was from Jersey, he'd say, yo, who's going to open this thing? And there was no one found that was worthy to open the scroll. And John begins to weep. All of heaven begins to weep with John. There's no one worthy to open the scroll. The scroll is the title deed of the earth. And one comes up looking like a lamb that was slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus himself. He takes the scroll and he's able to open it. You know why? Because he owns it. He paid for it with his very life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He purchased us. The only way we're going to go to hell is to trample over his dead body. He did that for us. And so he opens the seal. Jesus, his very name means Jehovah is salvation. And it says that he's been given this name now that he, he exists in human form. That God is salvation, pointing everybody back to himself, strangely enough. And so he's on a throne. If you know anything about what the scripture says, he now has become so much better because he has earned the right to call himself the boss of this place and certainly of our souls. Uh, just so that you understand something about angels, Angels were very well um, lifted up and venerated. Saints never were. Like you never find in the past in the Hebrew people praying to Abraham or people praying to Jacob or praying to Isaac or praying to one of their moms. You, you, never, you never find that. The Catholic Church kind of makes a big deal of that. But the scripture says that there is one mediator between man and God the man, Jesus Christ. So just so that you understand. But the angels were really important and they've done all sorts of things and there were always these ministering spirits, the scripture says, and they were involved in getting the word of God or the Ten Commandments, God's disclosed will, to Moses. But you don't see that in a movie, like with Charlton Heston. You're right, Moses. You, know, you remember the movie, right? You don't see that, but the angels were actually instrumental in getting the word of God to Moses. I find that interesting. And you don't find that out until you get to the New Testament and they start talking about it, which is interesting. But I, I bring it up just as an academic point for some of you who wish to fill some of that empty space with facts and figures. And so here, it's very interesting, even um, when, when Stephen... When there's a sermon going on in Acts, we see that it was delivered by angels. The law was delivered by angels and uh, nobody was able to keep it. And it says that he came with 10,000s of his angels to Mount Sinai and it was actually delivered with the administration of angels. Just so that you know, because you might not have that right picture in your head. The next, the next bit of passage are going to be seven Old Testament passages to demonstrate how Christ is superior to the angels, just so that nobody confuses. Now, certainly if he's more important than angels, he's certainly more important than any other human being, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pray, make sure you pray in Jesus's name to the father. Don't pray to St. Bernard or St. <laughs> Aloysius or St. You know, whatever, who was ever in charge of bowel movements or whatever. <laughs> no, there's a saint for everything. There's a saint for everything. I know there is. I just don't know them because it doesn't matter. But you're going to see there are going to be seven passages that are demonstrated now from the Old Testament, which are going to show Jesus Christ is the greatest, much to the surprise of Muhammad Ali. Verse five, to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. 
But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Angels, which are considered way up here, but certainly above you and I, worshiping Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Angels are told to worship Jesus. Well, then he's got to be more than a man. And he can't be less than God. In Psalm 2, verses 6 to 12 is where this is from. Here's the context. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. This is God the Father speaking of his son. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you, which we read. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron, which means you're going to be in charge. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. That's a very interesting Old Testament passage. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. The Old Testament scripture says, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and puts him on equal par with the father. Make, make sure you get it good with the son. And, and that's our message, isn't it? That's called the gospel. Make sure you get on a good standing with God. And the only way you're going to do that is to admit what a failure you are and accept God's grace and forgiveness. So when did Jesus become a son? We already saw that he was instrumental in creation and that he was there before anything else was. So when did he become a son and say, now I have begotten you? It almost sounds as though he is created and brought into existence, which isn't the case, but some people would think so. When did this happen? Well, there's a couple of times it happens. Once is in Matthew 3.16. It says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's rather interesting. Do you know the, the next time that this happens? It's at the transfiguration. If you remember uh, Peter, James, and John, the special ed crew, they were up there with Jesus. He was making sure they didn't cause trouble. Matthew 17, verses 4 to 6 says, And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And we can just all hang up here. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. In other words, shut up, Peter. And don't put Jesus on par with these guys. Make sure you listen. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. That's, that's a good response. That's a good response. God comes down and says, hey, cut it out. Okay, I'm done. No more outhouses for anybody. So it's interesting. Why did, why did God the Father do this twice? Well, if you remember, it's always two is the number of witness. So it's always two. It's if there's two or more, there's, uh, everything has to be verified by two or more witnesses. It's okay. It's, it's a detail. I'm sorry. For which of the angels did he ever say, you're my son? Today I have begotten you. And it's interesting, let all the angels worship him. It's actually in Deuteronomy 32, 43. And say, well, um, we know angels aren't worshiped, right? But the angels are told to worship Jesus. But God alone is the only one to be worshiped, is he not? According to the scriptures, that's exactly right. People aren't supposed to worship anything but God himself too, Correct. And yet here in John 20, Jesus, after he was resurrected, it says after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them and Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. And he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. God. And you know what? Jesus accepted it. Right. If Jesus was something like an angel, he would not accept worship. 
If Jesus were any less than God, he would not be worshipped. And yet he is. So it's an interesting thing to share with people who don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. He accepts worship. There's other times when he accepts worship too. If you remember coming into the town of Jerusalem, he comes in and they're all saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, save us now. And the Pharisees got all burned up and said, Do you, you better shut these people down because they're speaking blasphemy. They're thinking that you're the savior. You know, you're, you're like God. He goes, if these don't do it, the rocks are going to cry out. Jesus not only accepted worship, he encouraged it at that point. So there's times when Jesus accepts worship. And I just find it amazing that nobody finds that odd if he's not God. Matthew 28, 16 to 17 says, when the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain in which Jesus had appointed them, when they saw him, they worshiped him. You don't see Jesus saying, cut it out, guys. Come on, you got it all wrong. No, they worshiped him, but some doubted. You ever feel like sometimes you come to church, you go, I don't know why I'm doing this because I'm struggling so much in my life. And I, you know, well, it's interesting because the disciples worshiped him and some doubted. So you'll always have that mix even in, inside yourself. Any of you feel that? Yeah. I don't, I don't feel like I can come before God and do anything. Well, he's the one who welcomes us. He's the one who invited us. He's the one who sent his son to love on us, to show us how much we mean to him. Why would you not accept that invitation? It's the best invitation you'll ever get. God says, come to me. You are labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come and take, take my burden upon you because my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And learn from me because I'm meek and humble of heart. And you'll find rest for your weary souls. So Jesus asks us to come. And he says, this forgiveness is for you. All you have to do is accept it. And it will change your life. Amen? Amen. And it changes our lives. And, the, and to the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. He makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. It's interesting. Did you know that angels are spirits? but they take on human form. In fact, they take on all kinds of forms. Some of them are scarier than others, but, but they take on form, which is rather interesting. And you have fallen angels, which are the same. You guys remember when the three visitors showed up for Abram and they came and visited him? One of them was different than the other two. I know because Sesame Street tells me so. <laughs> One of these things doesn't belong with the other. <laughs> Two of these creatures, these things, they go off to Sodom and the one who remains with Abraham is called Lord. And this person says, shall we not tell Abram what we're about to do since he's going to have children and descendants? And he goes, okay, I'm going to tell him. He says, you know what? We're, uh, we're sending out a couple of uh, uh, Soldiers, we're going to straighten this out because we understand there's some trouble in Sodom. And they do. And these spirits, which took on human form, and they were, they brought down fire from heaven, which I find coincidental with that passage. Anyway, so they bring down fire, but one stays back and talks with him and he calls him Lord. So it's an interesting thing. I believe it was a theophany, which is the pre-appearing of Christ in a physical form. But they bring down fire onto the city of Sodom as a judgment against them. If you remember, the very presence of God was associated with fire, with this bush that burned up on the mountain that Moses took time to go see. He goes, I got to go see this. It's better than Ripley's, believe it or not. I mean, this is something, there's a bush on fire, but it's not getting burned up. That's kind of weird. And this is before they had landscaping lights that would light up your bushes, you know, so this is like weird. So he goes and he looks, and of course, a voice comes and he says, take off your shoes because you're walking on holy ground. Okay, that's a surprise. That's a first. 
He says, now that you're 80 years old, congratulations, happy birthday. I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to deliver my people. And so your, to the son, he says, meaning God the Father says, your throne, O God. God the Father calls Jesus God. Don't you find that interesting? I think you should. But your, to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Jesus, the son, is God, the son. Make no mistake, and Hebrews is very clear about it. He is no angel. And to the Jewish mind, that would be like, oh, yeah, wow, I never knew that. That's a big deal. In Psalm 45, 6 to 7 is where we get this. So, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. It's interesting. Did you see uh, Charles get, get crowned? Any of you see that? No. Uh, none of you care. Okay, except for one. <laughs> you know he has two scepters? There's two scepters. One is his governmental authority, and the other is that he's the head of the church. It's got a cross on it and everything. So these are symbols of power and authority that get thrown around pretty cheaply here on the earth. But Jesus was better than, he was anointed. And in fact, the, the, the word Christos means that. He's the anointed one above his companions. And certainly Jesus, looking like all the other disciples, was not like the other disciples. And he was considerably different and God crowned him. But that's not all. It says, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Amen. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow like, they, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? The presumed answer is none. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Yes. So Jesus is not an angel. He's far above angels. Angels worship Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can save. He's the only one who's God. In John chapter one, he begins this way. In the beginning was the word and notice the capital W to help you understand. In verse 14, it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So he's using a, a literary style where he's referring to Jesus as the word, the communication from God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Before Jesus ever became man, he was God. He preexisted before time. He was in the beginning with God. Notice there's a separation between him and the Father. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing has been made that's been made. Which, call, which means we can call him the creator. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. That means in him is the only one where there is life. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it or the darkness could not overcome it. You see, Jesus is the light. He's the communication from God to us. Don't look for something else. Jesus is it. Make sense? Okay. In Revelation 6, 14, it talks about the sky being rolled up. The sky was removed like a scroll when it was rolled up. Every mountain and island was moved out of place. This is... Again, talking towards the end times when the Lord comes back, we're going to get a, we're going to get a, a remodel like you never saw. And the sky is going to get rolled up. So it's another place in where this is written. 
And in Psalm 110, where we get the part of this passage, the Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, in other words, un until your enemies are serving at your feet. And I, I, the, uh, the Lord send, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion rule in the midst of your enemies. So God is saying, wait for a little bit and I'm going to take charge and make everybody realize who you are. Because when he came the first time, certainly we didn't treat him that way, did we? So he's telling Jesus, just sit down. I got this under control. I'm going to take care of it. And everybody's going to realize who you are. Did you know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord Amen. before the presence of the Father? Amen. There'll be no more questions. There'll be no more arguments. So Jesus is seated at the right hand, which is always speaking of the, the power, the dominion, the honored side. And then he says, what about angels? Well, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? You see, God never says to an angel, here, sit down, relax, take a load off. I'm going to make everybody worship you. He doesn't say that to an angel. Of course not. In fact, angels are always busy, aren't they? There are no rest for angels. You don't see angels sitting down. You don't see them laying down unless you got like a little, uh, you know, figurine in, in, in behind glass somewhere. Like one of those guys. You see, Jesus was told to sit down at a position of honor and it's done. When Jesus said it's finished, he means it's finished. It really was finished. And now he's just waiting. Time is going to work itself out. God is going to work out all of his plans and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Luke 17 verses 7 to 10 says, Jesus wanting us to understand the difference between a master and a servant. It's one of those things. If, if you're used to having somebody serve you, uh, that you, you could kind of get used to that, to the place where you disregard them. Any of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I, any of you married? I mean, my goodness. <laughs> my wife just takes for granted that I'm going to cut the grass. So the grass isn't cut. And she goes, grass is getting kind of long. I don't ever say to her, well, go cut it. I never do that. And what, what I could do is say, you cut it. It's not my job. But that wouldn't be right, would it? No. Come on, people. <laughs> now, if I tell her I'm hungry, hey, I'm hungry. There's a lot of a passive-aggressive stuff going on in my house. <laughs> hey, I'm really hungry. Are you hungry? I'm hungry. What do we have to eat? Because I don't know anything. I can't open a refrigerator. You can get so used to somebody serving you that you just take them for granted. Jesus wants to straighten a couple of things out here in this passage in Luke 17. He says, and which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and hear and eat. There's no master who would do that for a slave. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk. He doesn't mean drunk. He means past tense of drink. And afterwards, you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I think not. Really? So likewise, you, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done just what was our duty to do. Jesus trying to straighten out the heart of the disciples because they go up to him and say, hey, I'm hungry. <laughs> Excuse me? They hardly have a place to do that. And he's trying to straighten them out. Jesus is trying to teach them. And they say, well, increase our faith, Lord. Hold on. <laughs> Jesus is asking them to do something. What they do is they ask him to do it for them. And so he's got to straighten them out. There are certain things that we need to do, and we need to make sure we keep those lines. Jesus is not my servant. That's what he's saying. Hey, God, can't you hear me? This is what I want, and I don't have it. I really want a new Lamborghini, and it's beautiful and green. Why don't I have one? You know, there are people that think they have a right to go up to God and do that kind of thing. Shameful. 
You don't do that. You say, Lord, what would you have me do? What do you want me to drive? Amen. I think that old Chevy over there is something you should have. <laughs> okay, I'll drive that and I'll be glad. And I'll say, listen, I've only done my duty. I'm just doing what you told me to do. There's no reason to get boastful. There's no reason to think you're going to snap your fingers and God's going to give you everything you want. You don't want everything you want, trust me. Because if you got it, you'd be in deep. So Jesus straightening it out. Now notice, Jesus is now sitting in the position of honor. Angels don't do that. The comparison between Jesus and angels is getting further and further and further as we look through all of these Old Testament scriptures. So he's not an angel, regardless of what anyone else might tell you. And do you realize that we're going to inherit salvation and that angels are servants of God and servants of ours? As weird as the world has made angels, they exist, regardless of whether you think they're little babies with little bows and arrows and, you know, all that kind of weirdness and, you know, you know, sexy feminine angels and all kind of baloney that's out there on the internet. Angels are real. They're there by God and they're ministering spirits for us. And there's stuff going on in the spiritual world that you don't see. You need to know that. Sometimes we make a brush with it and we remember. Sometimes we don't, but it's happening. Here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus with the kingdom parables, is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. And when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Jesus talking about treasure in a field. I don't know about you, but I've always had dreams of finding treasure. Like buried in the sand, you know, some pirate. Ah, buried in a tree. I'm going to bury it here. And then he gets killed off and nobody knows where it is because the treasure map, you know, is in his pocket and he's overboard, you know, I, I'm going to find the treasure. I always have the, when I was a kid, you know, I always wanted a metal detector, you know, go find these things. There are people that actually do that. Jesus talks about this and you go, what in the world is he talking about? Well, I used to think it was, I found Jesus and Jesus is that treasure and I give everything for Jesus. Or Jesus is that one pearl of great price and I sell everything else and I follow Jesus. But that's not right. <laughs> it's God who treasures you. You're the treasure. Aww. Thanks, God. And that's what he does for us. And it says that he came down and he gave it all, didn't he? He gave it all for us. And a pearl of great price, it's rather interesting because pearls are not kosher. And he's speaking to a Jewish audience. Pearls aren't kosher, dude. Pearl of great price, that's bizarre. I would never want to collect one of those. Well, I think the pearl of great price is you as well. Jesus came and he gave it all for you. That's the love of our God. That he came personally in the person of his son for you. If you haven't received that, gotten a hold of that, if you don't have a relationship with the king of heaven, you can. It's there for the asking. And today is the day you should do it. You should not wait another day because God has got to get busy in our lives, right? Amen. So Jesus is greater than the angels. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the 14 verses that are here. Number one, God speaks. He speaks through his son. Because he's God. He's our redeemer. He's better than the angels. It's a father and son relationship. The closest thing that you and I will understand as to what it is. The firstborn, who is God, accepts worship from the angels. Angels are only servants. Verse 8. Angels are only servants, administering judgment and also helping. Jesus is the son of God. Or God the son, however you want to put it. He has a scepter, which means he's in control. He has an everlasting kingdom, which will never end, regardless of what happens in the Ukraine or Russia or the U.S. or England or anywhere else. Those are all going down. The kingdom of heaven will never go down. 
and is valued above all. Jesus is valued above all things in all of creation. Jesus is the creator. Through all things, he was the creation. He created all things. He always will be. He's eternal. He's always been. He will be the one at the end of creation who tears it all down and makes the big remodel. Jesus sits and waits. And angels serve God and us. So that's essentially what it says in 14 verses. I, I could have just went to this slide and that would have been good, right? <laughs> Guys, this is the book of Hebrews. We're going to be taking a good, close look at who Jesus is, what he did, what his ministry was all about, how that has to bear on the Jewish population of the world. And uh, so this is the book of Hebrews. Hope you guys are going to enjoy it. Jesus says, no man comes to the father, but through me. Amen. He is exclusively the high priest. And we're going to talk about that in another chapter as well. And Cassius Clay is going to be very surprised. <laughs> so that is chapter one. Next week, we're going to be in chapter two. Jesus was compared to the angels. Now he's going to get compared to human beings. And it's interesting because God becomes man and steps down out of eternity. So how doesn't that lessen who God is if he comes down and takes human form? Contrary. It lifts him up even higher. So we're going to talk about that next week. <laughs>